Hello and welcome to episode number 13 of What Sex Got to Do With It. And we're here with my favorite <laughs> 84 year old great grandmother <laughs> on the whole planet. And, uh, uh, so, so, well, so, Len, Heather. you know what? Maybe I'll just have to live a real long time and then you can start with my favorite great great grandmother. Yes. That, that's a goal to strive for, right? Yes, is it? Yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. And the fact that you say you kind of started off, and then I, late. I th there wouldn't be so much competition. You know, yeah. the big, big thing about being a late bloomer, I mean, I think means that you know it's just all just kind of shifted. You know, so. means I have to live a long time yes. in order to do everything I've wanted to yeah, do. Uh, yeah. So, 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 so let's mm -hmm. have it. You know, but this chapter, chapter twelve, is called "Economics of Desire." as we always do with the basis. Okay, the uh, basis for this is that sexual desire, uh, particularly in women, is can be triggered by the economic prowess of the man in question. And I, I say can be, it often is. Right. The women I interviewed, the trait that headed the list, intelligence, of course, but that's kind of a generic term. Me, people mean different things by intelligence. But um, control of material resources right. was at the top of the list, the Got trait it. that influenced um, a woman's choice of yeah. her partner. This is going to be a hard chapter for me to um, you know, interview you on because there are just so many questions <laughs> I have on this one. <laughs> we, I could really spend I mean, easily an hour talking with you, probably an hour and a half. So, so I might be a little rude. Oh, be rude. Sometimes, me and and, 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 and and cut you off because I'm just going to try and get me yeah. oh. a bunch of questions. And you know, but I love listening to you. So you talk about me how we eat that we, when we do surveys or whatever, it becomes apparent me, that that. For women, I mean, an older man, you know, um, is preferred, you know, and for men, I mean, a uh, younger woman um, is preferred. First off, is that across cultures? Uh, yeah, I think so. Although my area of expertise is within this culture, right. so I don't want to speak for all cultures. Right. When you say women pre prefer an older man, it's not the age that they're selecting for. Right. It's age, enough time enables man, a man to accumulate resources. In this Bef when I did my research, there was no internet dating right. scene. But today, in the era of internet dating scene, one of the statistics that was in, uh, again, uh, the New York Times and the Washington right. Post inform a lot of my ideas um, that was reported in the paper was because it's easy to measure how many swipes left, swipe right, right, right. that um, men, the ideal age for women, if, in terms of right. what men preferred, right was 18. Right. In terms of women, the ideal age for men, I think, was 55. That doesn't really mean much, except that a 55-year-old man has had much more time to establish some economic stability. I think if a woman saw, a, if an 18-year-old woman saw a 22-year-old man with the same control of economic resources, that would be more likely found in someone 55. His youth would not work against him. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's it, uh, you know, I, I think it is correlated right. to, to right. just uh, well, economic security. Well, with the, the, the preference, though, for, for younger women, I mean, wouldn't just, you say our brains are wired for reproduction. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, so there would be a preference on younger women because there would be more reproduction potential. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's so, it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, useful vigor. I mean, young women look healthier, stronger. They move easily, more easily. So, you know, they're, they're, they're good choice if, if you want healthy children and they have more years to be reproductively active. So yeah, there's a reason. Uh, you know, there are evolutionary reasons. Obviously, right. there are people who run counter to that, but right. Um, right. you know, we're we're used to seeing men who, were they not wealthy, would not be sporting the trophy wife on their arm, what we call a trophy wife, right. that they are, uh, and that's kind of a cliche. You know, the the old 
man right. with his trophy wife, which may be his fifth or sixth wife, because as they age, he might tend to divorce them, and right. his wealth enables him to attract a younger woman. Right. I don't, I, I don't, I, that's yeah. not particularly behavior that right. I would recommend or that I personally admire, but, I, you know, I think we all are aware of right. the existence of that behavior. Right, gotcha. You know, so this is a, a minor curiosity question because you mentioned that you know mm -hmm. most women, men, and women do eventually have children. Mm -hmm. Do you have to know what like percentage? You know, you know that's hard data to find. When I, yeah, right. um, there is more w women reproduce than men. Okay, but it's hard to get the exact figure. But mm -hmm. in fact, women. Have are more in personally reproductively successful than men are. Interesting. Um, because That's really interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Because. Uh, well, because women are selective, and so you know if you they're trying to mate up, and so if a man is sort of at the bottom of the economic pile, he's going to have a harder time finding a partner. I mean, oh, I get you. Okay. Yeah. So right. yes, if women uh, are. Women are, are women are more selective than men are in terms of choosing their partners for all kinds of things. I get that. Yeah. But 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 then you said that most so so essentially I think what you, the conclusion I'm drawing is that in, that um, this, women in, will choose being more they're more selective about the men that they choose and because of that the fewer men get chosen, you know, and yeah. so it would... Like one man, we, I just was talking about a very wealthy man who might have multiple wives. Right. That's one man, you know, say he's had five wives and had children with all of them. Right, right. What, that means there are a bunch of men that might have wanted to have children with those women who right. have been shut out. Yeah. So, I was really so trying that's to, how it works. Right. So that's I was really trying to get at how the... The, 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 the dynamic the, of it. Well, not so much the dynamic, but that's part of it, but also how you end up with a mismatch between, because mm -hmm. you would imagine that you'd have equal number of men and equal number of women mm -hmm. you'd having children. So are you saying that there are more men who have multiple wives over the course of or, their right, life? Or have children women, from, with multiple wives. And there are women that have... You know, Children with multiple men. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Like I've been married twice, but I've had children with only one man. Right. Um, right. My second husband was very, very generous about um, contributing to the well-being of my children. Right. Well, was it, was that was, was, was that a timing issue or a choice issue? Uh, what's a choice issue? I had the, he had a child from a former marriage. Right. I had two children from a former marriage. I want neither one of us wanted more children. But was we, that a possibility? I was young enough that okay, I could right. have had more that's, children. Okay, that's what yeah. I was asking. Okay, right. But uh, his his enthusiasm, more than willingness, right. his absolute enthusiasm to invest in my existing children right. was one of his charms, I must confess. Not only my children, but every time he came to see me, he bought dog biscuits, brought dog biscuits for my dog. I mean, yeah. the man was a master of courtship feeding. He not only fed me, he fed, fed my kids, dog. he fed the dog. Fed the okay. dog. Yeah, when you, know, you said that. How, yeah, I, how I, could I, I not fall in love I, with this man? You know, in the generosity thing, because you were saying a that. That's, that's one of those, thing. like, what yep. do you call it? I mean, not soft traits. You call it, there's a term you use for those types of traits, generosity was one of them that you think that we could be, that women could be selecting. Oh, for. women do select for but that. But you called it something. You called I it. Did. Yeah, yeah, I'll scroll back at some yeah, point. Yeah. Get it. Uh, uh, I'll mention folks at the beginning of the next chapter because I'll scroll back and find it because you called it a certain kind of trait that oh, generosity oh, was. Oh, generosity. I mean, really, yeah. for a woman who has children, right. when Jean, that was my, my second husband's name, and I was a poor, starving graduate student when he met me. I mean, my kids and I were living on a very minimum income. Yeah. And he would take us out to a Chinese restaurant and essentially order everything on the menu, yeah. my two kids, yeah. his daughter, and any of their friends who wanted to come right. were more than welcome. Yeah. Early on in, in, in our marriage, and Jean and I married very quickly after we met, my daughter looked at all the food coming to the table and looked up at me and said, don't you just love bops? He's so excessive, yeah. and yeah, he was. He yeah. was over the top, generous yeah. in all ways. Well, uh, food is the uh, you know, 
way to a person's heart. You know? Yeah. So, so look, I, mean, I just have to. The, one of the other things that I really enjoy about reading, you know, um, um, your writing is that I think you're a really good writer. You have a oh, way of turning a phrase. So we're talking about Fifty Shades of Grey, <laughs> and you say, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is less about the erotic turn on of bottom spanking and more about the economic turn on of the bottom line. You know. They actually, let me re- let me read that correctly. It's less about the erotic turn on of bottom spanking and more about the economic turn on of bottom lines. You know, that's a great. I think that's I think that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really good. You know, but you do you do say that it uh, uh, what kind of makes it it um, not so creepy is that it it's a wealthy guy. You mm-hmm. know, uh, and that if he had been a, a poor guy. It would it have a whole different tone, be more like a stalker, I mean, um, and and and, uh, and maybe even an abuser, you know. But how about this? What if it was a penniless woman dominating a billionaire? A, a, a penniless man. Domi- no, a penniless woman. A penniless woman, woman uh, dominating. dominating a billionaire. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he would be paying her plenty to dominate him. Okay, now you didn't take my premise. You took my premise and you changed it. You know, let's, <laughs> let's let's stay with my premise. Okay. You know, uh, so, yeah, a woman. It, give me give me your feed that to me. Again. Sure, 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 sure. So uh-huh. so so would it be creepy if it were a penniless woman dominating a very wealthy man? Um, not quite as creepy, maybe because. Yeah. Yeah, what, not, he, he's, she's not exploiting his need for income. So it's not, you know, the, 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 the fact that a very wealthy man is sexually dominating this penniless woman, in some sense he's really exploiting her vulnerability, her economic vulnerability. Yeah. So in the case where it's a what was it? Well, a, a penniless woman. A, or, pen, or, or, a penniless, or, 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 a yeah, poor woman yeah. dominating a billionaire man. She's not exploiting. He's not. He's not economically vulnerable. He. He's. He. It's happening because he wants it to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was just kind of a fun question for me. No, it's, it's like, it was fun yeah, to think about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll, so I'm bouncing around a bit here because, like I said, there's just so much in, in, in this chapter. I mean, and so you talk about you know greedy people. Uh, and, and it's essentially the problems caused by greed. I mean, do you think people who are greedy realize that they're greedy? Oh, wow. I'm not a psychologist. Um, do you think I they just th- rationalize me? Oh, I think they rationalize but it, th- sure. Yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think they rationalize because it. Because the character in Wall Street, me, Gordon Gecko, mm-hmm. me, he said greed. Is and greed people, is good. Yeah. People often forget, though, that parenthetical phrase that he then said. It's like, like greed for lack of a better word, is good, you know, and so for me, I mean, that to me was sort of like, you could say, well, you know, he embraced the greed, you know, uh, but with that, that parenthetical phrase, though, kind of softens it up, and then you kind of realize... Give me the, the parenthetical phrase. It's like, free, uh, gre- greed for lack of a better word is good. Yeah, well, you know. yeah, I don't think there's a better word for greed. <laughs> I think you know. I think yeah. that that's a little bit of rationalization going on there, right. uh, for lack of a better word. So then you think greed is not good. No. Yeah. No. no. It, it, uh, con- uh, controlling more of the resources. Controlling so many resources that by your controlling them, other people are being denied, and that's what greed is. That right. is not good. Yeah. Well. So I wasn't saying it was good. I mean, it's, I was just kind of yeah. pointing. No. 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 I, I didn't think right, you were. But right. really, what I was getting at though is that do you think that people who are greedy realize that they're greedy. I, I think they're, we're all very good at rationalizing. I don't have more than my share. I've earned this. I've worked hard for it. Um, nobody wants to believe that what they have um, did not come to them honestly, quite right. frankly. Right. I'm good at doing that myself. Uh, this very generous man that I was married to worked for a very large corporation, um, and his Quite nice salary was built on the backs of people paid minimum wage scooping mashed potatoes in college dorms. Yeah. And um, I don't like to look at the fact that I have a nice condo in Arlington, and I do love my condo that was paid for by people who weren't 
earning the money they needed just to have what they needed. And so I myself am good at rationalizing the origin of wealth. Right. And certainly my husband, who was a generous man, right. and would give anybody literally the shirt off his back, neither one of us were very good managers of money. Right. Um, I, he would not like to think that his salary came at the expense of someone else. He absolutely believed in his talent. It was fully earned, and yet I say absolutely less so than, than most people, because he did one time say to me, you know, he was five years older than I am, he said, you know, I'm a very privileged generation. He said, I, I, I graduated from college, you know. Right, um, right. Men my age did not have to compete with women, people of color. Any job that I applied for, I got. He said that you know the the economy was booming post Second World War, and he said so. I I don't know what it's like to apply for a job and have any kind of competition, and and that points to so, so he did have an awareness right. uh, of of his privilege that right. came of being white and being male. Right. I mean, uh, the privilege born of being white and yeah. being male, uh -huh. and my privilege is born of having been married to someone who was white and male. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, well, it's very touchy, you know, that I, uh, I did, <laughs> trust me, it was not my intention to get to that emotional state. No, but no, my, no, my, no, my, no, that's, but, yeah, uh, but no, that's, no, that's, that's I love conversations. Yeah, yeah, you know, we yeah. learn from each other. Yeah. And as I was saying to you before we started this session, yeah. A question you asked me a few sessions ago. I woke up one morning thinking, "Oh, I know the answer to that question now." So it's yeah. so good to be in dialogue yeah, with people yeah. because that's how my theories yeah. develop. Well, you can always email me, or you can even call me when that happens, <laughs> and, and don't have to worry about waking me up because I turn my the volume of my phone off when I go to bed. So you can always no. just like when yeah. and I thought of the answer to that, and yeah. I love it. You yeah. know, no, uh, but no, so that's now part of my explanation of how the first uh, children born of that um, chromosome fusion right. happened to have mates. And I'm going to just quickly give it here. I think it's yeah. possible <laughs> that COVID has made me aware of it. Look at all the body parts that a COVID affection yeah. can hit, yeah. neurologically, um, lungs, heart, yeah. liver, uh, reproductive organs, mm -hmm. uh, COVID toes, taste buds. Yeah impacts whole body or organs. Mm -hmm. Look at our, our, um, our genome. Mm -hmm. There is what used to be referred to as junk RNA and right. junk DNA right. just because we didn't know what it did. Right. And then it was called dark RNA, mm -hmm. non-coding RNA. Mm -hmm. that, those are viral in origin. Right. And imagine if there'd been a huge pandemic that somehow, whatever the virus was, weakened the telomeres on the end of the mm -hmm. second chromosome, right. which I now believe is possible right. because of um, what COVID has taught us. So, you know, most viruses aren't studied that closely. Right. People can have COVID and not know they have right, it, right, right. and yet it can be impacting body parts. Right. It, and so imagine that the, the second chromosome, mm -hmm. the telomeres were just a little weaker than mm -hmm. normal, and this pandemic came through the primate, the yeah. non-human primate population and weaken those telomeres enough right. that suddenly um, chromosome fusions are happening yeah. more frequently than right. they would have. And so that, you know, when yeah. you were asking me, right. who would that, that, right. uh, that Adam or Eve right. have made it with, I right. thought, oh, it could have been the yeah. result of a viral yeah. infection. That, so see, that's yeah. what conversations yeah. make me think. Yeah. I wish I'd thought of it before I wrote the book, but well. hey. Time for another book <laughs> from the late boomers, all right? Yeah. But you know what? We so focusing on the greed thing, you know. Uh -huh. So, look, we, greed. I think, I mean, to a certain extent, it's kind of wired in, you know, because mm -hmm. we want more. I mean, oh. and, it's just, and as you said, our language allows us to accumulate more, whereas I mean, other species can't. So it's not like they wouldn't; they just can't because That's they don't right. have the language. Absolutely, you know? more yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Michael um, J. Ryan's book. Yeah. Um, a taste for the beautiful yeah. is what alerted me to right. this obsession with more. And he right. was not speaking about humans. Right. It's true in all species, but they're limited right. physiologically, right. and humans are not. Right. Symbolically, right. we can control right. everything. Yeah. But given that greed is such a motivating factor, do you think we could maybe pay people 
to incentivize them to do things that would be good for the environment? Oh, yes. I, or charge them. I, rather than pay them to do things that are good for the environment, charge them for doing things that are bad for the environment. But, but I generally think that the carrot works better the than the stick. The carrot does work better the, than the, the spe cause, cause stick. If you, if you hit that dopamine, Response yep. means the it carrot, will, the carrot yeah. works better yeah. than the stick. So, so maybe that's the way to kind of get people, you know, mm. to trying to pay them. You yeah, know? well, I, you know, you know there are like people, there are people now who are very given to service, yeah. that are already doing things that are good for the environment. A lot of people, particularly young people, right, it's already happening. I don't think that's the solution to our environmental problems. The goodwill of people who feel good or even get paid, like working in. Uh, um, oh, like Teach America, those yeah, kinds of right. programs. That right. if they have a program you're doing environmental. Right. So you don't good, think that's it's not sufficient. It, it's good. Right. It makes people aware. Right. It, it raises well, an awareness of right. environmental damage. Yeah. But I think if we want to change, can't let people get. We're economic animals. We respond to cost benefit signals. Right. That's why I was if it. something no, it, it's good. Yeah, the yeah. benefit. Yeah but also the cost signal. We have the cleverness. Those people who are good at algorithms, which I'm not, can look at any item we buy, this yeah. cup, this table, and calculate what the environmental cost of everything that went into it is, right. and charge, charge. For example, organically grown food ought to be cheaper than factory food. Right. Because factory food has inflicted a terrible cost on the environment, factory food production. But what those corporate farmers do, they, what do I say, they privatize the profit right. socialize and the socialize the cost. Right. Once you begin charging for the cost of food produced that way, then, then it flips and then the reward is food that doesn't damage the yeah. environment and its production yeah. is actually cheaper. When you charge what are called the externalities, right. all the externalities associated with producing a product, if, they, if the product reflects that cost, rather than corporations, and they do it, almost right. all of them right. do, um, privatizing the profit right. and socializing the cost. Yeah, I, mean, I understand where you're coming from. It's just that, uh, once again, I'm trying to think of how do we get me to a point that is better in, in, in a way that is politically palatable. And, um, and so so I, 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 I think that the, the trying to force those who have uh, to pay more is just going to create a lot more resistance than if you try to create a system where you tell those who don't have me, we are going to give you uh, money to do the the right thing, I mean, and they they could then create the political drive to do it. You know, if you say this is what we're aiming for, this is why we want to tax in these other individuals. And so, sure, the wealthy are still going to have to pay more, but it's being driven you know, by people who go. But you know what? There's something in it for me, and this what's in it for me is actually going to help the environment too. You well, know, so, I, yeah, I, uh, I think I think that's a good idea. I just uh, don't think it's enough, Lynn. All right. I, well, don't, I don't think it's enough. I, I think it's a good idea. Right. You know, I think a lot of that is happening already. Right. Yeah. But, um, I, I, you know, we have to get money out of politics. Right. That's a tough one. That's tough. Yeah. Because who would vote the programs that take money out of politics? Right. The very politicians who are benefiting from those programs. So I think exposing, I think exposing what's going on, that, that, uh, I think privatizing profits, socializing cost. I think once people catch on, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. Yeah. I think a recognition, that, hey, there's something not right about that. Um, and maybe there'd be a level of shame. And uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I hear it. You know, so, so, um, so I have two ways to go here. Uh, so growth. He, is any growth really sustainable? I mean, certainly compounded growth is not. Yeah, compounded That's growth easy. is not. Yeah. I think. What about uh, linear growth? I think some growth is sustainable. But the thing we have to keep in mind we have a finite planet. Right. 
and we are a species with infinite desires imposing our infinite desires on a finite planet. Um, I think once we realize that we are destroy, you know, we're killing the goose that's laying the golden egg, actually. Right. Hey, wait, wait, wait. What we're doing is going to make life untenable for future generations. I think then we may begin to reevaluate. Certainly, um, we can use resources more efficiently. And that makes growth more sustainable. There's a sustainable growth. I mean, I remember they, oh, how many years ago they predicted we were going to run out of oil, we were going to run out of, we haven't run out of those things. And in part because of our technological skills, we've switched to other resources, but also because we've learned to use those things more efficiently. So, and what forces the efficient use of a resource, a scarce resource? Charging the appropriately cost for using it. If you have to pay a lot for, say, oil or electricity, you begin to use it more carefully. Uh, you use less of it. You figure efficient. You, you design things that, that uh, you know, you can get the same outcome with less, less of input of a scarce resource. So that Absolutely. can happen. Absolutely. That, that can make it more sustainable. Right. Well, as I said, I was going to bounce around a bit, so I'm going to bounce over <laughs> to uh, and, and, uh, 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 you say, uh, I think this is talking, who says this, you know, you quote, quickly scanning, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. I guess that was a popular slogan in mm -hmm. the socialist movement, yeah. and he said today's corporate capitalism would be, uh, say, summarized from each according to his ability to each according to his power. Mm -hmm. But isn't power actually? I mean, um, isn't it always about power? You know, uh, it's because even in a de democratic system, I mean, you still have to enforce the laws. Mm -hmm. You know, and so so it is going to be like the power of the majority. I mean, and so it really, I think it's really a matter of uh, do those in power then watch out I mean, for those who aren't in power. So it's always about power, right? Yeah, you a few sessions yeah. ago, yeah. you brought up the issue we got into positive power and negative right. power. Yeah. I think it always is about power, but there are ways to design policies that keep power from being exploited, right. exploitive. And that's, I think I would focus on exploitive power. Some power is exploitive, right. and we have to design policies that would punish for exploitive power and, and charge for exploitive power. But you have to pay. Yeah, yeah, and, and also power that looks out for those who don't have power, because even though the majority may, may should win elections, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't mean that the majority and then gets to abuse the minority. I mean, so I feel that leaders, I mean, often they get elected by the majority, but they have to then look out I mean, for for the minority. And I think maybe that's a distinction we need to make, leadership versus power. Right. Leadership is is controlled or is concerned right. with everyone. Power is not. Power is wanting for yourself. That's what, yeah, whereas leadership, so you want to elect leaders, not, not people that are just powerful. We're drawn to powerful people. Yeah. But I think as voters and as citizens, we have to, and as women choosing partners, yeah. to make a distinction between someone who's just interested in raw power yeah. and someone who's a leader. Right. And, and there is a distinction, a pretty major one. And it sounds like you're talking sense to a species with all the answers. <laughs> That's going to be the next chapter. Thank you, folks. <laughs> well, Lynn, we're crazy. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are.